All right. You ready to go, Miriam? No, wait, wait, wait. Wait. Where are you? Okay, I found it again. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Should I share? We're live. We're live. You're you ready? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce the session, then we'll get started. Okay, so let me share. Oh, should I always get nervous with this shit? Even I have been doing so many times, I tell you. <laughs> okay, oh, you, no. you share a screen. Anyway, while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce the session and we'll kick off. So, yes. um, yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, yeah, this. so the thing that ties this session together strongly is a focus on uh, community empowerment, advocacy, and solidarity. Um, and I'm really excited about this session. I think we're going to have six really amazing talks here. So I want to begin with um, a brief acknowledgement of country. I am uh, talking to you from the traditional lands of the Wajuk Nungar people. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, in a community that's about, uh, about land and space and telling stories, I think uh, it's important to make these acknowledgements. So I just wanted to begin with that. Um, my name is John Bryant. I'm based in Fremantle, Western Australia. I'm involved in organizing Phosphor-G events uh, in Oceania for the last four years. Um, and I work with open source geospatial software at my company, Mammoth Geospatial. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, my friend, Miriam Gonzalez. Uh, she works in partnerships at uh, UP42, or is that UP42 or UP42? UP42. UP42 in Berlin. She's one of the co-founders of the GeoChicas Network. Uh, she's the president of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Board, uh, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap Team Board. And uh, she's here to talk about the HOT mission and the Audacious Project. So I'll hand it over to you, Miriam, where you go. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks a lot for this introduction. Uh, so, okay, let's start. So thank you for having me here. I really appreciate, I mean, the acceptance of, of this talk. I think it's important also to know what we are doing uh, as volunteers and also as part of the board uh, in HOT. I will be still a few more uh, weeks and then a new board will be coming. Uh, happy to be a part of the board and then my term will be coming to an end pretty soon. So uh, what is needed to add 1 billion pe uh, people missing from the current maps? So let me first probably give a, a brief introduction about uh, what is HOT, uh, what is OpenStreetMap, maybe for the people who is less aware about uh, the organization. So uh, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, HOT, is an international NGO. It started uh, around 2010. Uh, the, the, the thing that triggered, I think, the organization was the IT er earthquake. In the one, people realized that, I mean, of course, already OpenStreetMap was existing, but then there was not enough data to be able to support uh, what the country was facing at that time. So HOT is an NGO dedicated to humanitarian action and community development through open mapping. But why there are like HOT and also there is like the, the main project like OpenStreetMap. Let me give you also like a, a brief uh, kind of di uh, differentiator regarding I mean, what is one versus the other. I would say one of the main things, I mean, we can separate one from another is kind of the, the time, the pace that you need to be able to map. Uh, when I do some mapping in OpenStreetMap in the normal tool, like uh, maybe in the editor, there is no a time constraint. I mean, you can map today maybe some POIs, tomorrow maybe some streets, adding some buildings and at your own pace. I mean, there is no rush. But what happened with people is affected, I mean, from flooding? What happened with people is affected uh, because there was an earthquake? Then you need to give responses in, in, in hours, in days, and no more than weeks because people is already affected and they need your help. So how people are going to be able to receive help faster? I mean, of course, with, with data. And maps is one of the main things that they are used, of course, in, in the field. So that's, uh, I would say, one of the main, main things that we need to consider when speaking about maybe one or another project. So at this moment, HOD is working really hard to make uh, a world where everyone is counted, uh, map data is accessible and used in decisions that can really support uh, current lives. And everybody, that, that's the good thing, I mean, can be engaged and also can contribute to the map. So, I mean, we're in 2021, it's really hard to think that we're still living in a world in the one there is one billion people who are missing from the current maps. So these people live in 94 countries that already were like uh, defined by, by the hot uh, community, by the hot team. And then this is something that we really need uh, to look forward regarding the next future years uh, to be able to map because these people also is really affected by different issues such as disasters, such as catastrophes, and of course, uh, sometimes uh, even human displacements and some other issues they are facing. So it's incredible that today 
uh, we can consider that there is place in the ones there is no street names. Uh, there is maybe uh, no, no areas in the ones you can arrive because there is no data about these populations. So why is important? Because if you know how many people live in, in one place, if you do estimations about census, about how, how it looks the maps, maybe you can take uh, fresh water, purified water, you can take uh, sanitation, you can take hospitals, you can take clinics, you can take schools, uh, you can take even food. Uh, but what happened, I mean, when these people doesn't appear in the map, they are forgotten, they, they are not showing, I mean, that, I mean, that they need all these resources to be able to improve their lives. So how this humanitarian mapping can be supporting uh, with disaster response? So for example, I mean, I was already mentioning, I mean, what happened with people uh, is in areas in the one there is no data in case there is an earthquake or flooding. So this happens still, I mean, every year today. So we're seeing at this moment, of course, I mean, the climate crisis and already, I mean, this year, there were so many events that were caused by extreme weather events. So what is coming in the future, we don't know, because I mean, of course, I mean, it will be happening more and more. And then if we have data for these areas in the ones, we already know that all these things are happening and maybe other things will happen in the future. Then we are going to be able to work ahead of the curve and be able to respond better to the people needs in these areas. So the goal, as I mentioned, is, uh, is trying to map all these areas where people is living in these risk zones. And then they are also hit by extreme poverty and also they are hit by disasters. How is this process? Uh, there are maybe three steps that I can share with you in the one. One is the part in the one you add uh, remote mapping uh, volunteers. So you have this aerial imagery or satellite imagery in the one you will be drawing on top. You can draw, uh, draw a building, you can draw maybe uh, a road, a street. And then uh, another group of people who has maybe more experience and maybe also good eyes that they have received also certain training, they will do certain validation in order to say, okay, the areas that were mapped, they have enough quality to be able to see that, I mean, everything is, is right there in a, in a good shape. So also quality data is really important for all these projects. And of course, when you have already in the field, you have the local knowledge, the local mappers, uh, all the details can be added, I mean, to these to these maps. So the outcome will be having all these individuals, communities, organizations working together to be ready in case there's a disaster or in case they have to face local challenges. In this image on the right, you see the advances of the mapping project uh, in 2017 with Hurricane Maria. So even Puerto Rico, I mean, they already are considered like a, a place in the one that is data enough. I mean, but it was not enough. We saw how these uh, volunteers, they were able to map all these areas, I mean, in a few days. So let me show you here how kind of the process works. I mean, when I start uh, volunteering for OpenStreetMap, Something similar happened to me when I see this level C picture, level zero picture, sorry. So I was checking certain areas. I remember in Germany, actually, when it's my, my, my second home now, and I was seeing, I mean, all this uh, data on the maps, and I was amazed, I mean, about what I saw there. And then when I checked my home country, Mexico, uh, I saw so much data lacking. I saw all these areas in the ones, I knew they were towns, I knew they were cities, nothing was there. So that's how, I mean, I also decide, I mean, how I, I can collaborate better, I mean, with the people who's already working in the map in Mexico and, and see what can we do. So we start doing all these workshops all around. So there is this kind of levels uh, about the data that you can be added. I mean, the, the level zero is the one we face still in many regions of the globe. Level one is when people already added maybe the buildings and certain streets and roads uh, in the map. And still, I mean, even the data is not, I mean, in the level we want to have, it's a good starting point to be able to do some rapid disaster analysis and be able to help in a certain way. The level two, as you can see here, you already have certain names of the neighborhoods, then the names of the cities, and also you can do certain maybe vaccination campaigns, you can do some logistics. The level three, uh, I would say, I mean, you already have certain POIs, religious really centers, a point of reference regarding uh, maybe schools, maybe hospitals, and also you are going to be able to have certain campaigns, uh, sanitation campaigns or government planning. The ultimate level is level number four in the one you already have kind of this metadata in each of the areas. For example, in, the, in this hospital, you have is a clinic, uh, the, the hours of opening, 
capacity and some other things. So it's already having maybe even the name, the number of floors in one building. So it's so much data that you can be adding into OpenStreetMap and can be used for so many different things. So how we are planning to do all this one billion mapping uh, if uh, why we haven't done this in the past and why today is the moment for doing this project. The reason is that uh, the good news also uh, is that HOT was granted with the Audacious project in the one eight companies which were considered that they are going to be changing the world. Uh, it was chosen to be able to have all this funding, all this grant to be able to support this project. So it's really amazing news. So this uh, grant will be helping HOT for the next five years. Already the, the first year already passed. We're already uh, starting the second year of the of the project. In the one with all this uh, kind of uh, funding, you're going to be able to support in so many ways. And one of the ways uh, is also building this open map in regional hubs that I will show you uh, in a second. In the ones, instead of having this decision making, the one organization is deciding what to do. If right now, I mean, all the communities who will participate with the open mapping hubs, they're already to uh, that they just opened in the last few months, one in Asia Pacific and also the one in Eastern and uh, wait, Eastern South uh, Africa. They are the ones already like functioning and working at this moment. The ones pending are the one uh, from Western and North Africa and also Latin America and Caribbean. They are pending at this moment. They will be working together with communities. So in a long term, uh, the communities, they are the ones in charge of maintaining uh, the maps, the ones with the local knowledge, the ones also that will be working, I mean, with certain, of course, I mean, training will be provided, certain things that will make them self-sustainable communities also taking care of their own maps. So this is really great news. And also something is that all these uh, challenges that we have seen, I mean, at this moment, it's kind of more clear also how we can support different areas. So the areas that we will be supporting is, of course, disaster and climate resilience in two ways. As I mentioned before, there are certain things that happen, and then you have to be more, more reactive regarding the mapping of certain areas. Or you already know which areas are flooding every year. You already know where areas are hit by hurricanes. You already know certain things that happen in a common way in certain, certain regions of the globe. So you can do this anticipatory mapping before so when the time comes and something happened you already have the data and some at that time maybe you still need to do some mapping but not in the same amount of investment that you were doing i mean if you had already certain data in advance i will skip the second one for a second then get the quality of course uh hot uh, is really proud to also say that i mean most of the people in the staff uh, are women working uh, also in the leadership level. There are uh, many women. I, I forgot right now the percentage, but it's about also having all these equal rights, equal participation and improving. So more people, more women are involved in all this decision making at the same time. The fourth one is sustainable cities and communities. The, the fifth one is displacement and safe and migration. I mean, we are seeing right now all this crisis in Afghanistan, in IT, people trying to seek for asylum in USA. We are seeing also what's happening in Venezuela in all these refugee camps. So there is so many things happening. And then, of course, all these people also, which they don't have a home anymore, also they need to be mapped and see with this data how we can support them better. I will go back to public health at this moment because we're still facing a global pandemic. I mean, COVID-19 still is here and we have seen also how it has been changing so much. So. HOD also was able to provide uh, micro grants to different communities in order to support in a better way vaccination campaigns and also be able to support, for example, here in Peru, uh, in, in this image, there was a oxygen delivery campaign in homes in rural areas. In the ones without maps, it was not able to, to, to be done. So HOD and also uh, the people from GAL school and also uh, local governments were able to work together to add all this data to the map and be able to deliver oxygen to the people who was uh, in a life and death situation because of the lack of oxygen that they, they were having in their own homes. So with all this, uh, how is going to be working in the future the support to us in communities so there are many things that can be done and the six i would say that i can name here is like building more tools in the one mapping becomes more efficient it becomes faster and also with higher quality we right now have the tasking manager for edition in the one uh, i can say that, i mean it's a really strong tool in the one you separate the grids in the map and then people will not 
be overlapping to be map the area that they are doing right now and the people who is maybe another country will be mapping the the grid besides them, for example. So this is really an, a useful tool and people are using it a lot. So grants, more and more we're seeing how these grants are going to be going directly to the communities, to the regional mapping hubs. So that's something also really great news. Training, this is really, really important because, I mean, I would say there are two types of training. The training for doing a correct mapping, the training that you do also to educate more people for adding features to the map. But also there's some training in the one. We need to train the people to know how to use this data, to know how to take advantage, how, how to do analysis, to be able to also take better decisions. Partnerships, of course, is always important with local communities, with local NGOs, and of course with governments. Mentoring, also people who have maybe more knowledge in mapping, they can also keep mentoring, I mean, the, the newbies in the, in the in the area. And of course, networking is also super important to be able to spread the word about all these projects. So uh, one good news also regarding the grants is that uh, the hub, the open mapping hub in Eastern and Southern Africa already is uh, open for uh, receiving grants applications. So that will be great news because it will be the first one which is uh, going through this process. And then I'm really looking forward to see, I mean, all the ideas that people have in the in the region about how they can improve also their local communities. Really looking forward to that. So, and then I wanted to share a bit about also how I fell in love with this project, how I, I really enjoy participating. So, of course, being part of the board has been a learning process and I really enjoy it. But what I really am passionate about is how uh, I have been able to also visit the real people who is using the, the, the data, the people who is also facing certain struggles. And then thanks to HOT, thanks to OpenStreetMap, they are, they are having more opportunities. This is one example of one visit I did to Tanzania, thanks to the invitation of uh, Janet Chapman. And then here on the right, you have uh, girls who are escaping of female mutilation. So this is still uh, something happening in Northern Serengeti, even if it's uh, illegal practice in Tanzania. And then on the right, uh, sorry, on the left picture, uh, I am giving this training with field papers to all the staff working in this safe house. So thanks to, thanks to these maps, uh, these girls, they are able to know the way in the one they will be receiving help to not go into this process because this process also about the female mutilation is mainly take a place in their own homes by their own relatives. So this is something, I mean, uh, it's really, uh, I, I was able to, to do it and I'm very proud that I was, I was, I was there. The, the second project I can share with you is uh, the elimination of malaria in Guatemala. So using also the base map uh, of OpenStreetMap and also using Open map, Mapping Kit and also some other, uh, I think it was Kobo, we were able to add census data that before it was only capturing papers. So the previous governments, they were not able to deliver to the new government kind of a follow-up to see what can be done, I mean, to be able to improve decision-making. And of course, I mean, eliminated malaria is something that has been uh, pending and now also with COVID, I think it is a delay in the target for 2020. And then uh, this training took place in Escuintla, Guatemala. So thanks for this data, uh, people was able to, the local health of, health, Minister of Health, sorry, they were able to assign people to spray a certain lo locations, the ones they knew they were more vulnerable versus another ones, because maybe they have some water ponds, or also maybe they were open. So that's something also that uh, they already have the data to be able to follow this project in the future. So they have a before and after. So with this, I want to say thank you. And if you want to get involved, please uh, get in touch with me. And also you can check maybe tutorials. And also there is a really good uh, annual report from HOT already available in, in the web. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So there is still a long way to go. We are in starting year number two. So we are still having more four more years to go. and. I really am positive about the outcomes of the project after the five years. I think after five years, we're going to be having all these 1 billion people already visible in the world maps. And also these people, they will have the opportunities to be able to have uh, data that will help them decision making and also maybe social entrepreneurship, maybe something else that also can get them out of poverty. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. That great. Uh, what a what a great project. It's it's so uh, it's so ambitious, but uh, it's so wonderful. We've already seen it making a difference in in my region of Oceania and with OpenStreetMap Fiji and uh, the community building efforts going on there. So yeah, really exciting to see. Awesome. Um, 
So we've got a couple of questions uh, from the audience here. So I, I can just ask you the questions if, you, if you're ready. Um, yes, I'm ready. All right. Should I stop if a friend or do you read your lady, right? Sorry, say that again. Should I say uh, click stop the screen? No. Uh, no, you're good. You're good. I've already taken All it right. off. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, okay, question number one. Um, is the high level of presence of hot in Latin America related to geochicas, maybe? I would say that there are some geochicas who also participate in hot. Uh, and then uh, we collaborate in many in many ways. Uh, also, there was actually a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, one grant, one micro grant that also Yuchika has received to be able to add also street level imagery or around Oaxaca uh, in certain areas also hit by the by the earthquake. So I would say Yuchika is kind of the networking the initiative, and and we can work with a, any initiative in any organization doing mapping and also doing open source like uh, like OSGEO, for example. But uh, we don't have a specific project at this moment with HOT, but then, I mean, when there is a need of mappers who need to map certain area, of course, I mean, we share their, I mean, the activities and what training and what needs to be done to help other communities. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, how does the HOT community interact with indigenous people and territories around the world? Yes, I would say that there is uh, there is interaction. I would say that uh, the local knowledge, I mean, is is the key to be able to have success when mapping all these uh, all these regions all around the globe. So I think local communities, uh, most of them, I mean, they are also having this indigenous uh, cooperation. E even if these people they they are not mappers, I mean, sometimes I mean, some of them they, they become mappers. I saw some also one project I think from it was not from Hot was from one community in in Colombia in the one also they were they were helping I mean to teach so many indigenous people people sorry. So I think I mean it goes hand by hand. Because by the hand, I mean, you cannot leave out the indigenous or, or the originary uh, people, I mean, out of the out of the, of the map participation, because also is, is their territory, is their land. They, they have to be consulted, they have to be there also providing the data that needs to be able to support the, the map. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions about how people can um, get involved and contribute. So somebody's asking, if I want to organize a mapathon, who should I contact or how do I know where I should focus the efforts of my mapping? Oh, that's a great question. I think um, most of the mapathons, which are kind of spontaneous, are can receive maybe like some slides, maybe some tutorials. So I think in the Slack channel uh, of HOT, uh, people also can ask, I mean, support for the mapathons. So, and also they can be added to this uh, website in the one that is kind of like monthly mapathons all around the globe in the one people also know what's happening. And now mainly, I mean, it's of course online because the current situation. So I think that would be the, the best uh, way, I mean, in the Slack. If mm -hmm. they don't find the Slack, uh, please ping me in Twitter or send me an, an email, uh, mapanauta.gmail.com, and I can yep. point to the right people. And that's like that's an open Slack channel. Anyone yeah. can join. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think they just need kind of uh, the the link. Uh, yep. I will look for it, and I will try to post it later. Yeah. Great. Um, next question in the same vein is, what is the best way to contribute on my free time if I don't live near any of the regions that need more help and I don't have much geo knowledge? Uh, I, I would say, uh, I was showing before the remote mapping. So if you are in your living room, if you, if you are in your area of work at home, especially now that everybody kind of, is kind of working from home, I mean, you can contribute there. I mean, you can dedicate a few hours, you can dedicate half hour, uh, to be able to map uh, one region. I mean, you don't need to be in situ. I mean, I really like to go in situ because I, I really like to, to be in contact with the people. But of course, I mean, also I have a day job that, uh, that I mean, of course, I mean, it won't let me, I mean, go like one month away, for, for example, to do some mapping at this point. But I think uh, the, the best answer is uh, you can be at home doing some mapping. Also, people sometimes they do mapping or sometimes they decide to build tools. Sometimes they decide to see if they want to contribute in the committees. There is governance, there is risk committees. So it depends, I think, also what you like. If you like coding, maybe you will be better fit for the technical uh, parts. Maybe if you are like with low knowledge of your spatial, maybe start mapping and then get familiar with the tools. And that will be a good option. Wonderful, and maybe just one more question. Um, so, how, so how can the Phosphor G community 
get more involved with uh, some of the hot OSM initiatives that are happening here? What would, what would be the best ways for this to happen? That's a great question, John, uh, because actually uh, two weeks ago, we just signed a uh, MOU. Uh, uh, so we are going to be starting collaborating more and more. So I think at this moment, I mean, we can do it in an informal way, just start mapping, going to the tasking manager, uh, map from there. But then uh, there will be some meetings in the next couple of weeks uh, between uh, OSGU and also HOT regarding how we can also integrate more and more. Because also what we see, for example, in Philippines, uh, one of the, the colleagues in the board of directors, he was saying that most of the people doing uh, the local chapter in OS OSGU is also mappers in OpenStreetMap. So there is already like a nice overlapping regarding how we can collaborate together. So I think uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to know more. I mean, uh, if there is any recommendations about how we can do things together with OSGU and also HOT. But then at this moment, I mean, we can just start mapping together. It's great news. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th thanks a lot, Miriam. Uh, we'll leave it there. And yeah, thank thanks again for your for your talk. That was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys, and enjoy the rest of the event. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks, Miriam. Okay, we're going to take a few minutes break, and uh, we'll be back shortly with. Um, uh, with um, who are we? So with Mir Rodriguez Lombardo. So we'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs>